أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما نافعا اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه ربي اشرح لي صدري ويستر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to the Reflections on the Risale i Nur by Bedi Uzzaman Said Nursi podcast series. This is Mustafa Tuna. You can listen to the episodes of this series wherever you listen to your podcasts or at the website www.reflections-rn.org. I'd want to remind everyone that at the website www.reflections-rn.org, we have rough translations of what we are reading and inshallah those who would like to follow a text as they are listening can go and uh, use the text provided on that website however these are not for publication these are not ready for being considered finished works they are rough translations works in progress in this episode inshallah we will continue reading the 10th word we are actually in the conclusion of the 10th word which is a quite lengthy treaties we have been reading this for about 25 weeks or so uh, inshallah uh, we may finish today or maybe in, in the next episode but we are in the conclusion the tenth word is about the verity reality of life after death bodily resurrection and the hereafter reward and punishment paradise and hell in the hereafter it is an exemplary work of dialectical theology in which Ustad Nursi articulates rational proofs for the existence of the hereafter. This normally is considered among the Sami'at, among received matters or heard matters of faith. Uh, our scholars provided proofs for the existence of God and prophethood and the messengerhood of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and then once you establish this it makes sense that what whatever uh, God reveals to his messenger and whatever his messenger conveys to us is true and therefore there is no need to provide rational proofs for the existence of the hereafter however we live in an age in which heedlessness is so powerful and so easy to catch up with us and therefore we need as many proofs as many tools as possible to fortify our faiths and Ustad Nursi in this treatise does that he provides evidence for existence of God and relates that to uh, the concept of hereafter in each section or subsection of this treatise it has three main sections uh, the first one is a representational story in which we read this read the story and that sets a cognitive pattern in our minds and using that cognitive pattern that um, line of thought then we move on to uh, a more elaborate intellectual if you will discussion of the proofs that Stad Nursi provides in between there is a second section which is um, called introduction and in a sense it connects the representational story to the articulation of rational proofs that comes in the third section in the third section Stad Nursi provides 12 uh, arguments that lead us to have conviction that there has to be hereafter there has to be life after death and reward and punishment in that life after death so we read through all of this we read through the 12 truths and now 
we are inshallah going to start reading the conclusion of this rather lengthy treatise. Bismillah. Hatime conclusion. Geçen 12 hakikat birbirini teyit eder, birbirini tekmil eder, birbirine kuvvet verir. The previous 12 truths confirm, complete and strengthen one another. What this means of course is as it is clear that each truth is a powerful evidence, powerful proof that we can use in our struggle with, with our evil commanding soul, with the whisperings of the Satan, with the uh, allurement of the world, with the distractions of the world. As we move on in our lives, day to day, step by step, all of these try to pull us into heedlessness and make us forget that we are going to be accountable for what we do. And again, this is this is why it is so important to have these proofs in our hands. And each of these proofs provide a strong, strong fortification to our faith. But we should not think that they are you know, alone either. Whenever we think of it, we should think that there are 12 of them. And actually, there are many more. But these are the 12 that Ustad Nursi was able to... Um, receive as inspiration from the Quran and articulate for us. What we need to keep in mind is that this is really strong, this is really powerful and they are all together, they are supporting one another, they are confirming, completing and strengthening one another. Bütün onlar birden ittihad ederek neticeyi gösterir. All of them unite and show the result together. Hangi vehmin haddi var? Şu demir gibi, belki elmas gibi 12 muhkem surları delip geçebilsin. Ta hısn hasininde olan haşr imaniyi sarsın. In that case, which delusional thought has the capacity to pierce through and penetrate these iron-like, in fact diamond-like, impenetrable walls and shake the faith in resurrection that is in its fortified fortress in the fortress of these 12 truths let's pay attention to the imagery here that's an important part of Ustad Nursi's method in teaching us he gives us these images these metaphors that make it easy to catch ourselves when we are sliding into heedlessness because it makes it concrete if we said intellectually these truths are very powerful and we should uh, take refuge in them when we need to we should go back and contemplate them so that we don't forget about our ultimate accountability and so on and so forth that would be valid but when we think of the 12 truths as a fortified fortress as the walls of this fortress and when we think of ourselves as taking refuge in that fortress this gives us a concrete image that we can use to in a sense motivate our senses and also remember and keep in our minds as a cue so whenever whenever as we are moving through our life we feel that we are being pulled in that direction of heedlessness we should remember oh hold on i need to go and take refuge in that fortress i have my fortress of the 10th word and the 12 truths of the 10th word and it is a fortified fortress its walls are strong impenetrable our faith in resurrection is in the fortified fortress of those 12 truths now we should make sure to keep it there and take refuge in it ma khalqukum wa la ba'dhukum illa ka nafsin wahidatin ayeti kerimesi ifade ediyor ki bütün insanların halk olunması ve haşredilmesi kudreti ilahiyeye nispeten bir tek insanın halkı ve haşri gibi asandır the noble verse Again, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ma khalqukum wa la ba'thukum illa ka nafsin wahidatin. The meaning of this may be articulated as creating and resurrecting all of you is only like creating and resurrecting a single soul. This is God addressing human beings 
who may be doubting that there will be bodily resurrection. How can that be? And God says, look, creating and resurrecting all of you is only like creating or resurrecting a single soul. There is no difference between all of you and one of you. If I am able to do this for one of you, I'm able to do it for all of you. These are equal for me. And Stad Nursi is going to explain us why this is the case. So this noble verse expresses that the creation and resurrection of all humans is but like the creation and resurrection of a single person in relation to divine power. So here the key word that we need to understand and reflect upon is divine power in relation to divine power. I should not think of this as myself. Let's say I, um, let's say I'm going to tie my shoe. Tying one shoe is easy. Two shoes, okay, easy. Let's say I have a classroom of kids and I need to tie their shoes up. They are going to play a soccer game and they don't know how to play, the, uh, they don't know how to tie their shoes and they all come before me and ask me, can you tie my shoe? I have, let's say, 25 kids. Now, of course, tying the shoes of 25 kids is much more difficult for me than tying my own shoes. But that is me. That is the limited, impotent, needy, weak uh, human being that I am. I cannot think of God like that. God has divine power. And let's see how we can understand this. How we can imagine this. Evet öyledir. Yes, that is the case. That creation and resurrection of a single person in relation to divine power and the creation and resurrection of all humans are the same in relation to divine power. Yes, that is the case. Nokta namında bir risalede haşir bahsinde şu ayetin ifade ettiği hakikati tafsilen yazmışım. I had written in detail about the truth that is expressed in this verse and the discussion of resurrection in a treatise titled Nokta. Now this is a, a small treatise that Ustad Nursi had written in the, uh, the beginning of the 1920s or published in the beginning of the 1920s. And it is available in its original Arabic. And also it, it constitutes a part of a collated volume of some of Ustad Nursi's treatises from that period, which is called Mesnevi Nuriye in Turkish or uh, Mesnevi Al Arabi Al Nuri. And uh, Ustad Nursi's brother, Abdul Majid uh, Nursi, translated this into Turkish. And there are other translations too. But for those who can read Arabic, they can actually go ahead and read the original Arabic. But at any rate, Ustad Nursi says that he had written in detail about the truth, about this truth, that the creation and resurrection of all humans is but like the creation and resurrection of a single person in in the discussion of resurrection in that treatise called Nokta or uh, the point. Burada yalnız bir kısım temsilatıyla hülasasına bir işaret edeceğiz. Here we will point to its summary through some of its examples, some of the examples provided in that treatise. Eğer istersen o noktaya müracaat et. If you desire, refer to that point. I.e. if you uh, want to have a lengthier, more detailed explanation of this subject, you can read that treatise, inshallah. But here, there is a summary that Ustad Nursi is providing in the place of a conclusion for the tenth word. Mesela, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْعَلَى Temsilde kusur yok. Nasıl ki nuraniyet sırrıyla güneşin cilvesi kendi ihtiyarıyla olsa da bir zerreye suhuletle verdiği cilveyi aynı suhuletle hadsiz şeffafata da verir. For instance, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْعَلَى This is from chapter 16, verse 60. Its translation is, and uh, to God is the highest similitude, or the highest similitude belongs to God. But when Ustad Nursi uses uh, the, the phrase in this way, or when it is used in this way in the Islamic tradition more broadly, what it means is that, now we are going to give an example. When you listen to an example, when you um, consider an example, you focus on what is meant with it. 
examples may have aspects that do not necessarily fit the reality that it is trying to convey. If that is the case, you need to take what is good and useful and beneficial and leave what is not. Especially if we are talking about God and we are trying to understand what something that relates to God may mean with our limited understanding that is based on this uh, the created universe then we need to be really careful god is the creator and we live in the created world god is a necessary being and we all are contingent beings we cannot fully comprehend what god is how he is we cannot comprehend his quiddity we cannot comprehend his entity the essence of his entity and so on and so forth these are beyond our capacity but we can use what we know to know about god and we know about god through his imprints in the creation through his works therefore as we think about God, as we try to know about God, as we try to understand issues related to God based on the indications and information and notions of this limited realm, we have to keep in mind that at the end of the day, we are limited. And if there are aspects of the example that we are using that do not seem to reflect reality, we need to push them aside and try to understand what is really meant. So again, for instance, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْعَلَىٰ Let there be no defect in the example. So let there be no defect in the example that we apply to reality itself. In the way that the sun's reflection gives, the reflection that it easily gives to one particle, also to innumerable transparent things with the same level of ease thanks to the secret of luminosity now we are trying to understand what it means that that it is easy for god to create and resurrect all humans as easily as creating and resurrecting one human if we can see examples of this happening in that limited realm that that we can observe and we are convinced that okay this is possible then it becomes easy for un for us to understand that it is easy for god to do that so this is one example Ustad Nursi says the secret of luminosity the property the quality of luminosity as a result of that secret or that property the sun gives its reflection to let's say one small mirror that we might be holding in our hands but simultaneously it can give the same reflection to all mirrors that are facing it. It can give it to small transparent shiny particles, bubbles of water, maybe if there's snow, uh, snowflakes, and to the surface of the ocean. There is, there is no limit. Anything that has the capacity to reflect and that is facing the sun all at once can receive that reflection and the sun is able to give its reflection to all of them all at once so we can we don't say uh, well the sun is now giving its reflection to the mirror that's in my hand therefore you need to wait your turn if you want uh, to to hold your mirror to the sun too we, no that's not that's not how it works with the secret of luminosity the sun gives its reflection as easy as easily to one object and to all objects that are fa uh, facing it. Hem şeffafiyet sırrıyla bir zerre şeffafenin küçük göz bebeği güneşin aksini almasında denizin geniş yüzüne müsavidir. I already used this example uh, while trying to explain luminosity. And thanks to the secret of transparency, the small apple of the eye of a small particle is equivalent to the vast face of the sea with regard to receiving the sun, sun's mirror image. Now the first one, the secret of luminosity is about the sun giving that image and the second transparency is about those objects receiving the image. 
hem intizam sırrıyla bir çocuk parmağıyla gemi suretindeki oyuncağını çevirdiği gibi kocaman bir dirit notu da çevirir. And thanks to the secret of orderliness, or perhaps we can also say organization, as a child maneuvers the ship-shaped toy in his hands, so can he maneuver a huge dreadnought. So imagine a child uh, playing with the ship, and let's say there's a mechanism in the ship, maybe let's say the remote control, and he is moving the ship around using those uh, little levers and buttons, on the remote control. If the same remote control was connected to a huge dreadnought or battleship, if the remote control in the child's hand was connected to, to that ship, he would as easily move the ship because the child is not using his you know, muscle strength in order to do this. There is a mechanism that is in place. There is an orderliness that is built into the mechanism. The child can maneuver the toy and the child can maneuver the dreadnought with the same level of ease thanks to the secret of orderliness. Again, we see this happening in the limited realm that we live. Therefore, it's possible for God too. Why should it not be the case? Hem imtisal sırrıyla bir kumandan bir tekneferi bir arş emriyle tahrik ettiği gibi bir koca orduyu da aynı kelimeyle tahrik eder. And thanks to the secret of obedience, as a commander mobilizes a single soldier with the command of march, so does he mobilize a huge army with the same word. It doesn't matter whether there is one soldier or, or a thousand soldiers. As long as, as long as they are trained to obey the commander, they each will obey the commander and they, they will move all together. As soon as the commander says march, a thousand soldiers will march because they are trained to obey the commander. Now they are, they have the attribute of obedience. Hem muvazene sırrıyla cevvi fezada bir terazi ki, Öyle hakiki hassas ve o derece büyük farz edelim ki iki ceviz terazinin iki gözüne konulsa hisseder ve iki güneşi de istiyab edip tartar. O iki kefesinde bulunan iki cevizi birini semavata birini yere indiren aynı kuvvetle iki şems bulunsa birini arşa diğerini ferşe kaldırır indirir. And thanks to the secret of equilibrium a scale in space. So let's we are going to imagine a big scale. Let's assume that it is so truly sensitive and it is so big that it can sense two walnuts put, put in each of its pens and fit and weigh two suns. So let's imagine the scale first. It's so big, it's in space because we cannot fit a scale that big anywhere else. It is so sensitive that if we were to put one walnut on one side, it will, it will sense that. And it is so big that it can, instead of a walnut, we can put uh, two suns on each side. Two objects as big as the sun on each side. With the same force that lifts up one of the two walnuts in its two pans to the heavens and lowers the other to the ground. So we put two walnuts. One was slightly heavier than the other. Therefore, the one that's heavier went all the way down to the ground and the one that is a little bit lighter went all the way up. With the same force that lifts up one of the two walnuts in its two pans to the heavens and lowers the other to the ground, if two suns are present, it would lift one up to the throne, arsh, and lower the other to earth. Here the words that are used for uh, throne and earth are arsh and fersh and they uh, rhyme. The throne is something mentioned in the Quran and it indicates the locus of God's manifestation in his utmost sovereignty and paramount sublimity. God's throne encompasses and subjugates the entire cosmos and all realms of existence in the cosmos. It is a lofty, and encompassing station that includes the paradise too. 
it is the center and locus of the manifestation of all divine names and attributes at their utmost uh, level of manifestation so the, we imagine the scale again one side there's one sun the other side there's another sun another star one is slightly heavier than the other that one goes all the way down and the other one goes all the way to the throne madem şu adi nakıs fani mümkinatta nuraniyet ve şeffafiyet ve intizam ve imtisal ve muvazene sırlarıyla en büyük şey en küçük şeye müsavi olur Hadsiz, hesapsız şeyler bir tek şeye müsavi görünür. Since among these ordinary, deficient, transient, possible or contingent beings, we are referring to the the world, the material, physical realm that we live in. Here, things are ordinary, deficient and transient. And if they are not deficient for any reason, they are deficient for being transient. And they are possible or contingent beings. They need something else. They are dependent on something else to exist. If we think of anything in the created realm, we we would understand that nothing here can exist on its own. Everything that we can observe or even think of in the created realm depend on something else to exist. So when we sift through the entire realm, we come to the conclusion that nothing here can exist on its own therefore there must be something beyond the created realm that we can observe that does not depend on anything to exist that the existence of which is from its own and everything depends on that we call that the necessary being and that is god god is the necessary being wajib uh, wujud and everything else are mumkinat everything else are possible or contingent beings contingent in the sense that they depend on something else something else wields them into existence they are contingent between existence and non-existence and something the existence of which is from itself and the non-existence of which cannot be even thought of wields them into existence so since among these ordinary, deficient, transient, contingent beings, the biggest thing becomes equivalent to the smallest thing, thanks to the secrets of luminosity, transparency, orderliness, obedience, and balance. So we observe all of these in this limited realm. And boundless, unaccountable things appear to be equivalent to a single thing. So that's the case. That's what we observe here. Elbette kadiri mutlakın zati ve nihayetsiz ve gayet kemalde olan kudretinin nurani tecelliyatı ve melekutiyeti eşyanın şeffafiyeti ve hikmet ve kaderin intizamatı ve eşyanın evamiri tekminiyesine kemali imtisali ve mümkinatın vücud ve ademinin müsavatından ibaret olan imkanındaki muvazenesi sırlarıyla Az çok büyük küçük ona müsavi olduğu gibi bütün insanları bir tek insan gibi bir sayha ile haşre getirebilir. Now up to this point we thought about defined, described and thought about these secrets. Luminosity, transparency, orderliness, obedience and balance and we said that thanks to these secrets the difference between one and many disappears. Therefore, the disappearance of the difference between one and many is possible. And then we said, why not for God? But we, we are going to move uh, a step beyond that, a step further and say, well, we actually observe these secrets, these properties in the creation and in the relationship of the creation with the creator therefore it is not only a matter of possibility but rather it is an actual fact it is valid that thanks to these secrets th there is no difference there will be no difference for god between one and many and there can be other secrets too those that we know those we don't know those that we can possibly know and those we will never be able to know 
these uh, the, the 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 secrets that are mentioned here do not exclude the possibility of others but these are really visible really conspicuous in the creation and therefore it is easy for us to look at them think about them and uh, again fortify our faith since among these ordinary i'm going to take from a little bit before because this is actually a single sentence i uh, broke it down into two parts but we will now read the previous part again so that the second part makes sense since among these ordinary deficient transient contingent beings the biggest thing becomes equivalent to the smallest thing thanks to the secrets of luminosity transparency orderliness obedience and balance and boundless un uncountable things appear to be equivalent to a single thing since that is the case in the created realm that we observe of course thanks to the secrets of the luminous manifestations of the absolutely all-powerful ones essential endless and utmostly perfect power so again uh, we are not going to look at possible defects deficiencies etc that the metaphors that we use might uh, imply once we put that aside we can think of god's power like the the uh, sun's light the way that the sun's light can give its reflection the reflection of the sun to every object all at once god's power the divine power of god and also utmostly perfect uh, complete power is like that it can act upon everything all at once and again thanks to the secrets of the luminous manifestations of the absolutely all-powerful ones essential endless and utmostly perfect power and these are important uh, words that we are going to come back later essential endless and utmostly perfect power and also thanks to the secret of the transparency of the dimension of things that relate to the realm of domination Melakuti yet this is something that we touched upon maybe a couple of times uh, before but it is a, one of the very important concepts or uh, realities that Ustad Nursi teaches everything in the creation has two aspects maybe more than two aspects but we are going to focus on two now at least three but we are going to focus on two now one aspect relates to its material existence it is lowly transient not worth paying too much attention to it is there it serves a purpose and because it serves a purpose we do not reject it we take it as what it is and we use it we use it because it is necessary to be there for the other aspect to be there too we use it to get to the other aspect contemplate and know about our lord which is the ultimate purpose why we are here in this in this world to know and worship god and the other aspect is the aspect that faces god the creator Ustad Nursi calls the first one manai ismi the second one manai harfi and these are terms that he borrows from uh, arabic grammar uh, but uses them in a completely different sense here manai ismi relates to the that material existence and manai harfi relates to the aspect of a thing that indicates its creator and therefore it's tr it's translated as indicative aspect so everything Ustad Nursi is saying has two at least two aspects one is material and there it is it is dense it, it is substantive it is not transparent it does it it is uh, transient and weak and so on and so forth but the other aspect the indicative aspect is there to reflect it if you think of a mirror one side is going to be opaque there will be a material there and the other side of that material that is facing the glass right is going to be transparent the opaque side is necessary because that is what uh, what catches the light and then and makes that thing a reflective object right so the indicative aspect of everything in the creation is transparent it's its very function 
and definition is its ability to reflect God and that is the aspect of things that face the realm of domination and ultimately the realm of uh, command and the realm of domination is again this is uh, something we learn from the Quran and there are more than one ways that people think about it some say uh, translate as the angelic realm uh, ultimately what it comes to is that it is a realm in which God's command is um, is effective without the veils that prevent us from seeing it directly in this realm so the veils are lifted veils are lifted God's command is directly visible apparent and the names and attributes of God that manifest through that command as he wills to manifest himself uh, through his command through his 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 will are directly visible in the in the realm of domination alim melekut is the the arabic or turkified version of uh, the, 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 this this concept alim melekut and alim melekut is the turkish version so the transparency of the dimension of things that relate to the realm of domination and another secret thanks to the secret of the orderliness that issue from wisdom and divine determination again when we thought about these concepts luminosity transparency orderliness etc they are not just abstract concepts they are things that we can observe in the creation in relation to the creation's relationship to God the orderliness that issue from wisdom and divine determination sometimes people will call these natural laws and that is a mistake they observe something and what they observe is there so their observation is truthful but they interpret it in in, in a mistaken way they give it the wrong name it is not nature's laws nature is not something it does not exist as such it is not a thing to which we can attribute agency it is just a concept that we or not we hopefully not we that people have developed in order to uh, refer to all the various patterns of interaction among the created beings all together they call that na nature but what it really is is God's command and God has willed to act upon things the, in the in the in the creation or manifest his will on things in the creation in certain patterns and our scholars have referred to this as uh, adatullah or sunnatullah the customs of god god's custom and the these patterns issue from wisdom and divine determination when god builds these patterns of exchange in the creation he builds it with wisdom in the sense that everything serves a purpose and he is the one what the ultimate end of all those purposes is and therefore this also relates to divine determination and because of God's custom there is orderliness in the creation there are patterns of interaction in the creation and because of that when we let's say put fire on a piece of cotton the cotton burns it appears that the fire burned the cotton to our eyes but in reality there is nothing that really connects the fire to the cotton as the cotton is in the process of burning there is something else going on and that is God's custom God is the one who creates the fire God is the one who creates the fire touching the cotton and God is the one who creates the cotton in the process of burning so this is orderliness and it is perfectly possible for him to build another mechanism another form of orderliness 
in the creation that enables the bodies that disintegrate the souls that separate from their parts their bodies right to come back together when they receive the command this takes us to the next secret the perfect obedience of things to the creational commands that govern them so it's directly related in the way that luminosity was sun giving the light and uh, transparency was objects receiving the light right here orderliness is god instituting this custom in the creation and obedience is the created beings being receptive to god's command being created in a way that they are receptive to god's command the perfect obedience of things to the creational commands that govern them and these are creational commands fire burns because god commands fire to burn when apple is disconnected from the tree it falls because god commanded the apple to fall when it is disconnected from the tree or you can also think of this as the earth pulls the apple because god commanded the earth to pull the apple and finally thanks to the secret of the equilibrium between the possibility of contingent beings which means that their existence and non-existence are equivalent little and much big and small are the same for him for god uh, so if it is 50 50 existence non-existence for a contingent being its existence has a 50 percent chance and its non-existence has a 50 percent chance the tiniest force the tiniest impact put on one side will be enough to bring it into existence or to push it into non-existence everything in the realm the created realm are contingent beings and there is the resurrection of bodies of human beings their recreation is a contingent thing from the point of view of god that it is going to happen and that is not going to happen have 50 50. it all depends on one word kun god says kun fayakun and it is this is not 10 percent to 90 percent 50 50 equal between existence and non-existence and the smallest impact can bring it into existence or take it out of existence therefore thanks to all these secrets that we can now observe in the creation little and much big and small are the same for him for god with a single blast he can resurrect all humans like a single person so this is here the word is saiha when the, the hour arrives angel israfil will be commanded to blow into uh, the sewer the a, a kind of trumpet or something that we can imagine like a trumpet and that will produce a a, a noise saiha, a noise and that's going to trigger things so with a single blast he can god can uh, destroy everything and with a single blast he can bring them all back into existence as bodily human beings and doing this for all human beings is as easy for him as doing it for a single person and doing it for a single person for him is absolutely easy there is no difficulty involved in relation to god's power and we are going to understand that in the in the uh, next sentence inshallah hem bir şeyin kuvvet ve zaafça meratibi o şeyin içine zıttının müdahalesidir furthermore the degrees of strength and weakness that a thing possesses are due to the penetration of its opposite in it uh, the, the a more literal translation would be uh, the degrees of strength and weakness that the thing possesses are the penetration of its opposite in it but it's easier to grasp what is uh, what is being referred to when we say due to so that's how i'm going to translate it uh, inshallah furthermore the degrees of strength and weakness that a thing possesses are due to the penetration of its opposite in it mesela 
hararetin derecatı soğuğun müdahalesidir. For example, the degrees of heat are due to the penetration of coldness. Güzelliğin meratibi çirkinliğin müdahalesidir. The degrees of beauty are due to the penetration of ugliness. Try to understand this. Uh, heat. If there is no coldness, how can we how can we degrees to heat? That will be just one heat, one temperature. Right? And the example of light, at least for me, is somewhat easier, and we will come to that. Ziyanın tabakatı karanlığın müdahalesidir. The stages of light are due to the penetration of darkness. If a person was put in a room a, with, uh, let's say, a, a spherical room, so that there will be no you know, shade, a perfect sphere, the person is at the center and light fills the entire room, there is absolute light. Absolute light. No shade. Then it would be impossible for this person to 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 talk about or even conceptualize if this was all this person saw all his life. Conceptualize degrees of light because light would be just one thing. Perhaps we can also think of this also it's although it's not the same thing, we can perhaps Think of it as fish out of water. A fish that lives in water all its life does not even recognize the water. But if you take the fish out of water and all of a sudden it is depleted of oxygen, then it recognizes the water and then perhaps you can put it in water a little bit and then take out, don't torture the fish, but we are just you know doing this as a mental exercise. And then the fish will recognize the degrees of oxygen that is flowing into its body sometimes it is more sometimes it is less while it was in water it was all the same so ziyanın tabakatı karanlığın müdahalesidir the stages of light are due to the penetration of darkness the degrees of beauty are due to the penetration of ugliness right if you if you think of beauty as this um something that appeals to us that affects a force of attraction in us right so let's let let this be the, our definition of beauty something that affects a force of attraction in us if there is no repulsion and we are attracted to everything all the same then there will be no degree of uh, beauty everything will be absolutely beautiful so I'm hoping that this this pattern of thought uh, takes its place in our minds, settles in our minds a little bit, so that we can move on to understand the rest. Just contemplate it a bit before we before uh, we move on. Fakat bir şey zati olsa, arzi olmazsa, onun zıttı ona müdahale edemez. However, if something is essential, not accidental. Its opposite cannot penetrate it. Now here, of course, we need to understand what essential and accidental uh, mean. Essential is something that is in the essence of a thing. You cannot conceptualize that thing without that. An attribute that is in the essence of a thing, an attribute that you cannot think of that thing without that attribute. If you take that attribute, that thing ceases to be that attribute. It is not given to it later on. It is at the very definition of it. Let's say a table. Now it is going to be very difficult to define the essence of a table because there are many different types of tables. But each time we see a table, regardless of whether it has three legs, four legs, one leg, uh, wooden, metal, plastic, etc., etc., we recognize it as a table. So whatever that is that enables us to grasp the concept of a table as a table and to uh, to to identify its members, individuals, 
in that fit into that concept whatever that is that is the essence of a table however you can take a table and paint it blue then you take another paint and paint it brown take another paint and paint it yellow so blueness brownness yellowness four-leggedness three-leggedness one-leggedness uh, being metal plastic wood glass whatever none of these are in the essence of a table we can see a table in either of these forms and we recognize all of them as tables so those attributes that apply to uh, an individual table or many tables doesn't matter that can be taken off of the table they, that is that the table can be stripped off and still remains a table these are accidental those are accidental now God God did not come into existence in time he always existed he is pre-eternal and post-eternal he is eternal and he is eternal in a perfect state therefore we cannot think about things being added or subtracted from god we can add blue paint to the table and we can take it we can add uh, we, we can add another leg to the table we can make a four-legged table a five-legged uh, table all of these are possible and all of these happen in time we can add it take it away now God is eternal and he is perfect he is perfect in his eternity bir şey zati olsa arizi olmazsa onun zıttı ona müdahale edemez so if something is essential the way God's power is essential and it is not accidental it is not added to it taken away from it and it can uh, remain what it is uh, with or without that thing right and God's power is not accidental right if something is essential not accidental the opposite of it cannot penetrate it because the penetration of its opposite would mean would make it accidental would would I mean God would cease to be God if power were to uh, if his power were to uh, be limited by weakness and that's not our definition of God our definition of God is perfect all-powerful and that's not just a mental exercise for us we know that God is all-powerful so we know that God is all-powerful and power is his power is from his essence he created everything in time and be, and before he created everything in time there was nothing so his power measures against nothing and anything measured against nothing is infinite endless boundless his power is boundless his power is essential he had power in eternity before he created anything çünkü cem yazıtlayın lazım gelir bu ise muhaldir because that would require the combination of opposites and that is inconceivable the, the combination of opposites is inconceivable and when we say opposites here we mean absolute opposites like something cannot be absolutely hot and absolutely cold at the same time something cannot be absolutely black and absolutely white at the same time something cannot be in existence and in non-existence something cannot be existent and non-existent at the same time these are uh, absolute opposites and the mind does not take it it is inconceivable for the mind and it is inconceivable for the mind because it does not happen in reality If something is essential, non-accidental, its opposite cannot penetrate it because that would require the combination of opposites and that is inconceivable. Demek asıl zati olan bir şeyde meratip yoktur. 
In that case, a thing that is elemental and essential, a thing, a, a, a thing that is in the essence of some something that makes it what it is, right? There will be no degrees to it. There will be no degrees in something that is elemental and essential. Madem kadiri mutlakın kudreti zatidir, mümkünat gibi arizi değildir ve kemali mutlaktadır. Onun zıttı olan aciz ise muhaldir ki tedahül etsin. Since the power of the absolutely all-powerful one, so that's our definition of God. That is what we observe God to be. That is what God tells us that he is. The power of the absolutely all-powerful one. And, and, you know, it's easy to understand this. God is a necessary being. Everything else is contingent beings. Which means that everything else is 50 to 50. All attributes that everything else has, 50 to 50. Existence and non-existence for everything else, 50 to 50. And God is the necessary being that wills everything into existence and into existence in the form that they are at any given moment. And there is no difficulty involved in this. He is therefore absolutely all-powerful. Since the power of the absolutely all-powerful one is essential, it is not accidental as is the case for contingent beings. And since it is at the degree of absolute perfection, it is inconceivable for impotence which is its opposite to penetrate it. If something is essential and at the degree of absolute perfection. So what is perfection? Perfection means that there is nothing beyond it. It is at the utmost level that it can be. And God's power is at the level of absolute perfection. And, what, and, and it is essential at the level of absolute perfection. What that means is that anything any any inkling of weakness that could that we could possibly imagine in relation to God's power right is not possible because it would take away from his per, uh, the perfection of his power and i'm not uh, providing a circular argument here i'm not saying that i think of god as having absolute power and therefore Anything that can possibly take away from his power cannot apply to God because he is absolute power. Now, this is not just a mental exer exercise. I'm not just thinking of God as absolute power. I am establishing that God has absolute power because he is the necessary being. And if God is the necessary being, that entails that he has absolute power. And everything else are contingent beings we can observe and we can see that everything else are contingent beings they come into existence and they leave existence they change form in existence right and therefore they are contingent beings and god is the only existent being only thing in existence that is the necessary being and it entails that the necessary being will have absolute power over the all contingent beings. So we are establishing that God is absolutely all powerful. Since the power of the absolutely all powerful one is essential, it is not accidental as is the case for contingent beings. And since it is the degree of abs it is at the degree of absolute perfection, it is inconceivable for impotence, which is its powers opposite to penetrate it. Demek bir baharı kalk etmek zat-ı zülcelaline bir çiçek kadar ehvendir. In that case, the creation of a spring is as easy for his majestic entity as a as creating a flower. Eğer esbaba isnat edilse bir çiçek bir bahar kadar ağır olur. On the other hand, if it the, the creation of a spring or flower, if this was referred to causes, what you know some people call those like natural laws, right, causes and effects. If it was referred to causes, 
a flower would become as burdensome as a spring one who does not create the spring cannot create the flower because the flower finds it ex its existence in the spring one who cannot create the world cannot create a spring because spring happens on the world one who cannot create a solar system cannot create the world because the world exists in the solar system one who cannot create entire existence cannot create anything hem bütün insanları ihya edip haşretmek bir nefsin ihyası gibi kolaydır and for God, giving life, giving life and resurrecting all humans is as easy as giving life to a single soul. Um, we are at the end of the conclusion and from here on Ustad Nursi is going to give us some verses from the Quran that have especially inspired the 10th uh, word. Inshallah, we will stop here and uh, recite and think about those verses in our next episode inshallah and if we can we will uh, try to finish then subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma 'allamtana innaka antal alimul hakim wa akhir da'wahu man alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin al fatiha